Good morning, colleagues, and very welcome to this webinar on signal detection and analysis in the Union Pharmacovigilance Database. My name is Irene Zanetti. I'm Change Manager at EMA's Veterinary Medicines Division. This webinar is the second training event on the new EVVET3 system, and it will focus on some practical aspects related to the implementation of the module on signal management of the guideline on veterinary good pharmacovigilance practice. This training is spread over two days, today and tomorrow. Should you not have registered in tomorrow's session, we encourage you to, as a separate registration to both WebEx events is needed. Today, we will cover uh, the following topics the regulatory framework, the approach to signal management for marketing authorization holders, signal prioritization, signal detection, signal validation and further assessment, um, the due dates for signal management, and targeted signal management. Tomorrow, colleagues will demo the system and show the queries available to marketing authorization holders and how to perform signal management and take advantage of the full data sets. At the end of the session, of today's session, there will be almost a one hour session for your questions. Uh, we will ask you to please type them into the chat and we will respond to those, to some of those already during the session and take uh, other questions during these uh, Q days at the end of today's uh, uh, webinar. Should you have any additional questions after today's event, you can always reach out to us at vetchange.program at tma.europa.eu. We will type the address into the chat. Um, please also let me remind you that today's session is being recorded for training purposes and uh, it will be made available on EMA corporate website in the coming weeks. By continuing to be in the session, you are consenting to be recorded. Your personal data will be processed by EMA in accordance with regulation EU 2018-1725. Should you not agree to be recorded, we kindly ask you to leave this meeting. After this short introduction, and without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Jos Olarz, head of uh, EMA's Veterinary Risk and Surveillance. Jos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Irene, and welcome to you all. Hopefully, many of you have been part of the initial training um, more than a week ago. It was on adverse event collection, and we hope this has been useful, and we'll try to make, and to make the same thing today and tomorrow, just to say it, so today it will be a different session than tomorrow. <clears throat> Some people inquired and thought it might be the same. So today it's more um, the theoretical part and tomorrow it will be Laura Descalso giving more uh, practical, uh, going into the system and showing you how to, um, to do the actual queries. Um, so next slide, please. So where are we? Um, about two weeks ago, we, we reached the final conclusion of the guidelines with the adoption in the CVMP and the CMDV, and they have been published, um, I think it was last Thursday, and on that website that you can see on the screen, you can reach them. And today, from the six modules, the main one or the main new element of uh, this legislation is about signal management, and that's also the subject of today and tomorrow, the training. And this is all based around the guideline on veterinary good pharmacovigilance practices and the module signal management. So you know we have the, the regulation is uh, on the top, which is supported by a specific pharmacovigilance commission implementing regulation. And then we have the six modules of the guidelines and the specific one on good pharmacovigilance practice signal management is the subject today. Next slide, please. So just an overview on the 10th of November, hopefully many of you were already present on adverse event collection and recording. And then the middle part is where we are situated today on signal management. Um, we gonna, have two parts on signal management. One is more related to the actual guideline and how to perform signal analysis, which is today and tomorrow. And once we have the systems ready uh, for showing you how to submit the signals, this will then take place in the training um, during January. These are the two dates of January. And then there's another 
inspection and pharmacovigilance master file um, training foreseen for the 8th of December. Next slide. So in terms of the, the main systems that we'll be using, just as a recap, this new legislation for the first time, we will have a union product database, which provides us with, first of all, the product data, but from the Farmvidges point of view, it would also have QPPV data as well as the PSMF reference. The Union Pharmacovigilance Database, for most of you, this is known as Eudrovigilance Veterinary, which contains already and will uh, keep on collecting all the adverse event reports. And the other part that we'll be showing mainly tomorrow is the data warehouse, so how to access and how to analyze the data that are in the database. And then the, the final um, data system is the signal management reporting module, which, which is being worked on, which will allow you to submit the signals and the annual statements and also to allow you to submit and, and to um, communicate any alerts. So that will be the subject of the training in January. Next slide. So what we're gonna be showing is you how we <clears throat> do the interpretation, how we feel um, with the regulators, how this pharmacovigilance system and signal analysis should be working. But it can be applicable um, not only, of course, for Eurovigilance veterinary, so how, how would you do signal management on the central systems that we will be providing to you, but also on your own systems, um, because legislation specifically allows uh, companies to use your own system to do signal analysis. Um, there is a caveat there that there is a requirement that once per year, uh, you will have to do at least one query and we will come to that uh, come to that uh, during training, one query in the central data system. Next slide. So this is just a little allegory of, I, I think, where we are. We are still with a lot of people, and that's all, not only us, but also you um, made this skeleton. Skeleton is there, um, and now we have to fill in the inside. Um, this is the Amish old man. Of course, a lot of you are luckily women helping us to work. And their religion is, our religion, let's say, would be pharmacovigilance. Uh, on this picture, you also don't see the, the basement, which normally has the, the service, the, the technical services. It's a bit like now, we, we know there are a lot of them still under development and being tested and being released very soon. Again, again, that is for the second training coming up in January. But just, <coughs> apologies, just to say that it, it's really up to us still to, to fit it out and to make it a, a comfortable house for the, for the future. And that's one of the main um, elements that we need to learn that there's still a lot of flexibility in this legislation, hopefully where we can fill it in ourselves in a way that is appropriate, um, that is also um, achieving the aims of the legislation, which is reduction of, of uh, administrative burden, but still maintaining a high level of uh, animal and public health. So next slide. If we briefly go to the key messages that we would like you to take with you after the training, is that single management is a continuous process throughout the product life cycle, that we will together find risk-based approach because we know in single, pure single detection inherently gives you a lot of false positive signals. <clears throat> so we have to apply um, risk-based um, approaches that allow us to really focus on the important elements. And then again, there should always be flexibility and sound scientific and clinical judgment uh, should always be applied. And that's not really any different than what we currently have been doing for many years. At the end of the day, single management comes still down to your clini clinical judgment of the, the information and the data that is provided. And then the last part is the trust, I think, um, one one element really important also in limiting the administrative burden is the trust that is being 
put in 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 all stakeholders, in particularly the marketing organization holders, you maintain to have the responsibility for your products. You you have the trust uh, to implement these guidelines to do the continuous single management. There is a caveat, of course, that this legislation foresees an increase also of um, of farming business inspections, which is a subject of another training. Uh, so where you as a company will have to prove then that you really have are doing this on a continuous basis, you maintain um, all the records in house of of your uh, of your daily work basically on single management. Next slide. Lastly, uh, coming back again, I think we never forget that we are doing those post authorization follow-up of our products to make sure that there is um, good public and animal health and the main contributors are our veterinarians, veterinarians that give us the data and we are also still are looking at how can we really give uh, useful and valuable information back from single management. It's not really part of the current training but it's definitely part of the legislation that requires us to publish that the, the information, the outcome of anything that we are generating through single management. So that's always on the back of our mind. Um, the outcome of what we're achieving with single management needs to be useful for the veterinary in the field. And that will be also uh, one of our focuses next year. And then I think we will start now the main part of the, of the training with my colleague, Daniel Zondag. Go ahead, Daniel. Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so my name is Daniel Sondag, and I will take you through the main presentation for, uh, from today, uh, which will be focused on the more on the theory. So we will focus on the on the recently published um, guideline on signal management, and tomorrow we will focus more on the practical side. You will be able to see. Um, uh, how the, the database looks like, how the queries and, and the outcomes look like. Um, but for today, we will focus on the main concept, how we interpret all this um, concept that we are introducing with the guideline. Um, so yeah, we, that, that will be the main part for today. Uh, we will take a break in between the presentation because maybe otherwise it's maybe too, too much information all at once. Um, next slide, please. So this is the, um, the overview of the topics that um, we will see through this presentation, um, starting with the regulatory framework, um, then some concepts of the overall approach to signal management for MAHs, um, then signal prioritization. We will see the, the, the MIE terms, emerging safety issues, um, then also signal detection, some, some practical aspects. Um, we will talk about the frequency of monitoring and then the signal validation and further assessment. We will see the possible signal outcomes and um, the signal notification um, template. Um, then we will also explain about the due dates for signal management and we will also touch the, the targeted signal management. Uh, next slide, please. So just to point out what is not in the scope in this training is the, the technical submission of signals in the Union for Vigilance database and the follow through of the regulatory procedures for relevant variations and, and, and post surveillance. Um, there will be more trainings um, that, that, that will touch this, this, um, these topics, but this is not uh, for, for today. Um, next slide, please. Um, regulatory framework. Um, next slide. So, as you may know, so we're focusing here on the main document. So we have the regulation EU 2019-06 and the Commission implementing regulation which complements this uh, main document. Um, they introduce uh, a lot of new changes uh, that you probably are uh, familiar with. Um, we will focus today on pharmacovigilance. Um, so we know that the, 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 one of the main aims is to introduce more streamlined uh, rules to make the system more efficient and, and to reduce the administrative burden for the, for the companies. And um, one of the special topics is signal management, which becomes a, the new focus uh, for, in, in pharmacovigilance here. Um, next slide, please. 
So uh, we already see in the regulation that um, signal management process is described as the gold standard for determining whether there are any changes to the benefit risk balance of veterinary medicinal products. Um, it establishes that the MAHs uh, shall carry out signal management process for their veterinary medicinal products and that the agency uh, will develop uh, good pharmacovigilance guidance. This will be adopted by the Commission and the marketing authorization holders should comply with this. Um, it also um, includes the definition of the signal management process and I think it's good to, to have it already here reflected. So it means the process for performing active surveillance of pharmacovigilance data for veterinary medicinal products in order to assess the pharmacovigilance data and determine whether there, are, there is any change to the benefit-risk balance of those veterinary medicinal products with a view to detecting risks to animal or public health or protection of the environment. Um, next slide, please. Then we also have the, the Commission Implementing Act. It also uh, complements with a lot of details uh, on the main document. Um, it establishes also that the signal management process should enable a continuous monitoring of the benefit-risk balance. And it also describes the, the process um, which may consist of, of at least uh, pharmacovigilance processes of signal detection, prioritization, validation, assessment, and the documentation of outcome. And we included here the, the schema that we also included in, in our guidance, how we see the process divided in, in the different steps. We will go through each of these steps in the next slide, uh, but we can see already here that we see a prioritization as a... Um, as more as a continuous um, process, more uh, than just a single step, and we will we will also see um, how the, each of these steps, um, the details of, of, of the, what they mean, and and how we we see them happening. Um, next slide, please. Um, so then we we have the the document that was just published on the EMA website. Probably um, most of you are also familiar with it. Um, this is the the document that where I'm basing the main uh, presentation for uh, from today. The veterinary good pharmacovigilance practices, uh, the model on signal management. Uh, here we provide um, the general methodological principles. Um, we try to describe the roles, the responsibilities, and the procedural aspects. So it helps MEH as to how to interpret the main legislation and going into detail of how this uh, everything is going to come into into place. Um, so all of them they 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 come into effect on the twenty eighth of January uh, next year. Um, and and well, there's also a glossary for def for definitions because there there's um, a lot of new concepts. Um, so yeah, this is this is also the the, the document that we're also very proud of. <laughs> um, next slide, please. So let's start with the overall approach to signal management. Uh, next slide. Um, so signal management um, is a continuous process throughout the whole uh, product life cycle. Um, and this is one of the key messages that we want you to take from today. So uh, MEHs are expected to continuously monitor the safety of their products. And that means um, that there should be a continuous monitoring of the Union Pharmacovigilance database. And um, as my colleague already explained, so uh, we know that th we need to apply a risk-based approach because we want this process to be efficient. Um, and, and therefore we need this sorts of criteria to, 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 have, uh, to have it risk-based. Um, we, will, we will come into more details to what we, what we mean by that. Um, but another key message here is that we are transitioning from a time-based um, approach into more of a data-driven pharmacovigilance system. So we know that um, PSURs will not be used anymore, so uh, we're focusing on signal management, and this is more a data-driven system. Um, and then also important that, that flexibility and sound 
scientific and clinical judgment should always be applied. So each signal, as we will see, each signal is different, each product is, is different. So you have to work with what the, uh, the data is telling you, but you have to be flexible because uh, it's difficult to give very uh, strict rules when 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 there are which each, when each case can be very different so we will try to give um, as much guidance as, as as we can but always having in mind that uh, we have to be flexible this is this is um, a characteristic of of the whole system it's not a bug it's it's how it should be um next slide please so um I think it's important also to, to, to reflect on the definition of, of a signal, what it is. Um, and we have it here. So a signal is defined as information that arises from one or multiple, multiple sources, including observations and experiments, which suggests a potential new causal association or a new aspect of a known causal association between an intervention and an adverse event or a set of related adverse events that it's judged likely to justify further investigation of possible causality. It's pretty long, but let's focus on, on what is important to take from here. Um, and I think what is important is that the focus should be on identifying new information. So what is actually new, new what um, if we're uh, trying to uh, assess a signal, sh we should always try to think, um, is this new, is this, um, is this already reflected in the product information or is, is there a change here? Because um, that's the main definition of a signal, it's new information. Um, then, um, so the word suggests in the definition reflects that a signal is basically uh, an hypothesis. So it does not translate always into a definitive uh, causal association. And for that, we will have to have this investigation to, to come to a conclusion. So if, the, if a, a potential causal association is, is likely or not. And then not all signals uh, represent risks or require further regulatory action. So many signals will be assessed and the final conclusion will be um, actually there's uh, the potential causal association is unlikely and, 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 the, and the signal um, can be refuted. So, um, yeah. Um, next slide, please. So um, to reflect on, on the different sources of information in signal management, uh, signals can come from, from, from different um, data sources, uh, data from clinical trials, uh, from scientific literature, from non-clinical trial data, um, also from post-authorization, post-marketing surveillance studies. And the one that we're focusing more today, uh, signals that arise from the unit pharmacovigilance database. So uh, we will focus uh, especially on spontaneous uh, data. And, and we have the, the unit pharmacovigilance database, which is the, the, what we're focusing for, for performing the signal management. And all of them can contribute to, to your um, process of signal management. Um, and when you assess a signal, um, even if uh, the signal uh, originates from one of these sources, you can complement your analysis and, and make the whole case stronger if you, if you have uh, data coming from other sources that can um, support your, your evaluation. So all of them actually contribute to your final um, assessment. Um, next slide, please. So, <clears throat> Just to point out, because we're talking about um, spontaneous data, I think it's also important to 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 remind that, that there are limitations to, uh, coming from from this sort of data. Um, some of them are the underreporting and the reporting bias, because the reporting is voluntary and may be influenced by external factors, which might influence the rate and the quality of the reporting. So uh, we also have the limitation of the data quality and um, missing data. Um, then some, sometimes we don't have the accurate um, drug exposure data. Um, we might ha we, we have confounded by indication. We might have confounders, either known, unknown. And, and sometimes also the problem of duplicate uh, reporting. So just to have in mind that, that this data is, is not perfect, there are a lot of weaknesses or, or, or limitations um, coming from this data. So just when, when we're doing our, our analysis, it's just good to have all this in, in mind. Um, next slide, please. 
<clears throat> and because of these limitations, it's it's also good to have in mind that um, <clears throat> sorry, um, frequencies of ADRs can be estimated um, when clinical trial data is available. And, and when we look at the ADRs in, in the product information in the SPC, uh, many of them are uh, based on clinical trial data. And um, in principle, the frequencies of ADRs um, observed in clinical trials should not be replaced by the frequency estimations based on spontaneous data because um, estimations are mainly um, a good estimation of the frequencies can be made from clinical trial data. But those frequencies that we can estimate from data coming from spontaneous systems, they are not so reliable because we don't have the, the, the we don't we don't know the real exposure to the product. So um, for for a real uh, and more valid estimation of frequencies, it's better uh, to have those fre frequencies estimated from from clinical trial data, which is not always available. But uh, we shouldn't have the idea that we want to 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 replace um, those frequencies from um, with those calculated from spontaneous data. So only in cases where there is evidence suggesting an increase in the frequency of known ADRs. And <clears throat> then maybe we can give cons consideration to um, open a signal and revise the frequency and a frequency that can be already there in the product information. The, 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 main, the main idea that I wanted to give here is, uh, is that um, we, 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 don't, we don't want um, to, to, we don't want you to, to start a performing signal, uh, detection and start performing estimations of frequencies and, and saying, well, because the frequency that I see on this database is lower or higher than what it, I see in the product information. Therefore, I need to open a signal and this is something. So we, we think that, that, that this should do, be done when there is evidence suggesting, um, a, a proper evidence that really suggests that there's an increase, but not just based on small variations, because we know that the, the estimations of the frequencies are, are different depending on, on, on the type of data that we're basing that, that um, calculation. Um, next slide, please. Um, so now we will go to signal prioritization. Um, and here we have the, the schema that we also included in our guidance. And as I was mentioning before, um, so we see signal prioritization as, as a continuous process um, that can be performed during the whole signal management pr uh, process. So not just to be performed at one uh, single step, but as a continuous activity. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, so signal prioritization is a continuous activity performed throughout the whole signal management process, from signal detection to signal man to signal assessment. So it's not should not be understood as a single step. Um, what do we mean by prioritization? Um, it means that uh, we use a specific criteria to focus on potential signals which require more urgent attention because they have a potential impact, uh, they might have a potential significant impact on the benefit risk or high impact on animal or public health. So um, it's a way to focus our the available resources on the most important issues. And um, for this, um, we have different values uh, that can be taken into account depending on, on which step of the process we're in. Um, next slide, please. So for example, we have here the, the, the medically important terms uh, that we have defined uh, in, the, in our guideline. Um, and these are used for signal prioritization. Um, the definition, the formal definition is, um, these are VEDRA preferred terms that identify serious medical concepts that are often casually associated with drugs across multiple pharmacological uh, therapeutic classes and should be uh, automatically prioritized. So uh, we developed this, uh, this, this, list, uh, this list of terms um, that um, will be used by EMA, by member states and by MAHs for prioritization. And, um, and basically these terms, we, we think that they deserve special attention, even in the absence of any statistical uh, disproportionality measure. Um, um, some of um, so these terms are uh, a species species specific, 
some uh, of these terms are only medically important in some species. Um, we consider that any events occurring in humans should be considered uh, medically important. And um, we also included lack of ef expected efficacy, uh, especially for products used in anesthesia. And those should also be prioritized. And, and just to point out that the list is not definitive. This is a living document. It will be updated and, and, um, in the future. And, and we will update this list based on the, on the experience gain. Um, next slide, please. So this is um, how the list uh, looks like. Um, so as I was saying, species are specific and it's a, um, a list of all the terms that we consider that should be prioritized. And it's, it's, in, the, it's in the annex of our, of, of our guideline. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one of the, um, one of the um, messages um, that we also included in our guideline is that, for example, in neuter vigilance, and as a general rule, uh, for signals involving a medically important terms, um, usually a minimum of three cumulative cases are needed. And for signals involving any other uh, PT terms, um, usually a minimum of five cumulative cases are needed. And this is, um, this. we thought about this um, um, tip uh, or sort of gui uh, more specific guidance because uh, I think it helps just to 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 have in mind that usually uh, signals uh, are based on on several cases unless you have one single case that actually involves a lot of animals then that's a different uh, situation but just to have in mind again so we should be flexible not to be this understood as a very strict rule but um, probably it helps to know that what we are expecting more or less so when we're talking about signals uh, involving mie terms we would think well at least a minimum of three case cumulative cases are needed while um, if they're not mie terms then at least five cases uh, would be needed um, and i think this 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 will help just to have an idea that um, we also don't expect um, companies to come with a lot of signals based on one single case, because we know that in most cases, one single case um, will not provide sufficient evidence to, to, to really come to a conclusion on a potential causal association with, a, with an adverse event. There are, there, there are exceptions, so we know that, yes, there can be one very well-documented case that can involve a lot of animals. And again, so each signal is different. We don't want to be very strict here, but just as general rule, uh, we thought that this might help just to have an idea uh, on, on the expectations. Um, next slide, please. So um, when we talk also about signal prioritization, we're also talking of, on, on, on what, um, what we find the main issues that we want to prioritize as the most, most important, the most relevant, uh, the most significant. And, and this is how we also went through in our guidelines. So we divided as the main issue that we want companies also to, to be very um, um, alert is the, 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 the emerging safety issues. And, and for this, um, this required a reporting without delay and no later than, uh, than three working days. And then and they will go through a separate procedure uh, which might involve the incident review group and they might involve also other regulatory procedures. Um, and these are, as I say, they, these are the most uh, important for us. Uh, and we will go through the details in the next slide uh, for, for the proper definition and, and some examples. Then uh, we have signals involving MIE terms. And as I said, uh, so if, if the MIE terms should always be prioritized, even in the absence of a statistical uh, disproportionality, and as a general rule, not to be very strict, but as a general rule, uh, we would expect at least three cases um, for signals involving MIE terms. And then we have other signals, so other signal involving other, uh, other terms. And for those, we, we can have, uh, we can take into account other criteria uh, that are also relevant. Um, and, and for those, as I said, we would expect um, generally at least five cumulative cases. Um, next slide, please. 
Um, so uh, starting with emergent safety issues, um, we have here the, the formal definition. Um, so what do we mean by uh, emergent safety issues? Um, this means a uh, new information which might influence the assessment of the benefit and risks of veterinary medicinal products according to Article 5810 uh, of Regulation 2019-6 and which may require urgent regulatory action and communication. Um, and, and this should be identified, uh, identified as an emergent safety issue. Um, it should be reported to, the, reported to the relevant competent authorities without delay and no later than three working days after the identification of the emergent safety issue. Next slide, please. Some um, examples of what we mean by, uh, by emerging safety issues. Uh, you can think of major safety issues in the context of ongoing or completed studies. So, for example, if we find an unexpected increased rate of fatal or life-threatening adverse events um, in, a, in, a, in a new published uh, study, um, then major safety issues from spontaneous reports or scientific literature, which may lead to a potential uh, contraindication, uh, restriction of use of the product or the withdrawal uh, from the market. Or, for example, also major safety issues, uh, safety-related regulatory actions um, outside of the EU. So, for example, if there has been a restriction of the use of the product or its suspension. Um, next slide, please. So we have here just to make it more, um, um, more going into more practical um, terms. So what do we see, for example, as an emerging safety issue? We know uh, we had uh, some time ago the case of cabergoline. Um, this was a product um, used in dairy cows as an aid in abrupt drying off by reducing milk production, um, to reduce the milk leakage at drying off, uh, to reduce the risk of new intra intramammary infections during the dry period and reduce discomfort. Um, and um, for this product, uh, there were serious adverse events reported in cows, including recumency and death, which were happening uh, within 24 hours of administering uh, the product. And at some point that there was this alert, we have all these uh, serious adverse events uh, reported. Um, in total, 71 reported uh, deaths in cows. In cows. Um, and even though the exact cause of the adverse events was yet to be determined, there was already evidence suggesting that it may be linked to the product, to the to the uh, cabergoline um, active substance. So um, this is just a, a very practical example um, um, of what happened um, and what we would consider at this time uh, an emergent safety issue. So uh, given the, adver the number and the severity of, of the adverse events that were following the use of the product, um, the CVMP concluded that the benefit risk balance was negative, and then and the marketing authorization was suspended in the EU in the EU due, due to the risks outweighing the benefits, and the company suspended uh, the sales and the CVMP recommended also a recall of uh, of the product on the market. So just to just to as an example, so just to see uh, what do we mean, what could look like a case of, of an emergent safety issue. Again, these are not very frequent. This, um, this happen luckily and not so often, but when they happen, they're, they're, very, port they're very important and, and it's, uh, action has to be taken immediately and, and with uh, urgency. Um, next slide, please. I think we have another example. Um, yeah, so another example, the BVD vaccine, we also had it um, some years ago. Um, uh, 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 this was a vaccine uh, uh, to prevent um, uh, the bo bove bovine viral diarrhea virus. Um, and there were concerns raised regarding adverse events, um, reports of uh, bovine natal pancitopenia following the use of the product in Germany. And um, so there was an urgent procedure started to assess all the data available from pharmacovigilance reports and epidemiological and laboratory studies. And uh, 
Yeah, similarly, so the CVMP concluded that although the etiology uh, of, of this pancytopenia had yet to be determined, there was already uh, evidence suggesting that the vaccine uh, was uh, or may be associated with the bovine neonatal pancytopenia, and they concluded that the benefit-risk balance was unfavorable, and, and therefore they recommended uh, the suspension of the marketing authorization, and there was a batch recall also recommended. So uh, again, this is just another example. So just to put into into to, just to have in mind what kind of cases we are referring by by emerging safety issues. Um, next slide, please. So what happens when when there is an emerging safety issue um, detected? So um, what should the MA, the MAHs do? Um, so the, the procedure would be that they have to create a specific entry in the relevant module in the Union Pharmacovigilance database. Uh, then they will have to fill in and submit uh, a proper notification form where, uh, where, where all this, the details of the, of the issue will be explained and the, and the, and the actions taken or planned by the, by the company. And, and they have to submit this uh, no later than three working days. And then, um, consequently, that the MEH is suspected and, and should collaborate with EMA and the NCAs in the assessment. And what happens from the EMA side uh, once uh, we receive uh, an ESI notification? So EMA will assess if the issue fulfills the definition of an emerging safety issue. Uh, the incident management plan will be followed and further regulatory procedures uh, might be started for example, a referral, so an evaluation of, of the whole benefit risk of the product and, and what me measures or actions should be taken. So um, we will go now um, into uh, signal detection. Um, next slide, please. Um, some practical aspects of signal detection. So. Um, Signal in pharmacovigilance uh, is more than just a statistical parameter that tells you that something is disproportionately reported in your database. Um, um, a statistical uh, detection methods alone are not sufficient to detect signals and spontaneous reporting databases. And uh, a very important uh, message that, that we want to, to convey here is that um, a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods is always preferable. Um, so um, basically what we mean, we mean here is that we want to give the message that a signal is not just a, a, a statistical measure telling you that, oh, this is a signal, this is not a signal. So we, we will always, um, we will always uh, request that, that more than just a, a statistical parameter, you should always do uh, a proper qualitative assessment of the issue. We cannot rely just on a, a statistical parameter to tell us if, if, if something is a signal or, or not. So the statistical part is helpful. They can really help us to see if, if, if something is disproportionately reported in your database, but it's, it's not the only um, thing that you can use just to support all your assessment. So, um, um, so um, also, if the data set if, if the data, data set is very small, there is no need to implement a quantitative method. So um, also this is dependent on the data set that you're using. So um, in these kind of cases, the, a qualitative review complementing uh, simple metrics. So for example, the number of case reports uh, would be, would be uh, appropriate. Um, and as I was saying, so disproportionality methods such as the ROR can help identify if certain events, uh, which certain events uh, you should go on to investigate. Um, and a signal of disproportionate reporting does not necessarily mean a signal of suspect causality. So you should always investigate what is behind this, uh, this measure of disproportionality. Um, next slide, please. And one of the key messages, um, again, is that statistical analysis and signal detection should always be complemented by a qualitative review of the cases. Um, again, if you're sending uh, the assessment of a signal, we are expecting a proper 
qualitative review. We, um, we, we, we're not expecting that the whole, uh, the whole review is just based on, on the statistics. So we want a proper uh, assessment of the whole issue. The statistical part can help you as a start, but then you should always complement this analysis with a proper qualitative review of the cases and of all the data. Um, next slide, please. Um, so um, another message that we want to give is that the, the screening and the quantitative analysis should be performed at preferred term, better level. Um, in principle, there, there are no data to suggest that screening at higher aggregation levels, such as the HLT, SOC level, uh, would detect more signals or detect them at an earlier stage. Um, um, however, we know also that in exceptional cases, uh, a group of adverse events might be associated and then it might be justified to analyze uh, the, the, the uh, several PTs together. And by this, uh, I don't mean uh, analyzing, uh, um, analyzing uh, different signals together, but uh, different terms as, as part of one signal. So sometimes when these uh, terms are related, then yes, we might be justified to, to, to put them together. Uh, but as a general rule, um, the screening and, and, the, and signal detection should be um, performed at PT level. Um, and this is, that's, that we have a good reference for this. Uh, there's been a lot of research performed by the uh, IMI Protect uh, group. And, and this was mostly performed with um, edge vigilance in, in human and, and they come with a lot of recommendations and, and we're following uh, similarly to, to, to the, how the best practice is also performed in, in human pharmacovigilance. Um, next slide, please. So um, more key messages that, that we want to send today. So um, uh, we want you to focus on new information coming. Um, there is no obligation in, in principle to assess his historical data. And that means that there's no need to start uh, looking for potential signals of adverse events in the database for which the, you have no new cases or, or no new cases have been reported. So let's say starting from next year, um, there's no obligation that you go through, uh, in the system and start analyzing all the historical data. Um, but on the other hand, if a new signal is detected um, based on a new cases that, that start uh, getting reported, then we would expect a cumulative review and this cumulative review should include all the available cases on the, in the in the Union Pharmacovigilance database and all available data. So I think, yeah, just um, another message that I think should should stay. And, and so no general obligation to go into the database and try to look for all signals based on um, associations that we don't even have new cases. But if you have new cases and then you're going to investigate a new signal, uh, we will expect a, a, um, to include all cumulative cases in the database and, and we will go into more detail of how to perform a proper assessment uh, and, and a cumulative review in, uh, later in the slides. Um, next slide, please. Um, then another uh, important topic, so how to decide on the frequency of, of monitoring. Um, uh, I, I, I added this from the Commission implementing regulation. Um, this is one of the points that that, that it's um, it's in it's in the legislation. So, um, marketing authorization holders shall perform signal management using a risk-based approach um, and monitor the data with the frequency proportionate to the identified risk. Um, the risk-based approach shall take into account the following topics. So the type of the product, the length of time on the market, and the stability of the pharmacovigilance profile, uh, identified and potential risks, and the need for additional information. And the risk-based approach uh, shall be applied to determine the methodology, the extent and the frequency of the signal management process, and the rationale shall be documented. So, um, yeah, so let's try to... to, to, to also interpret how, how, how we interpret um, this. So next slide, please. 
Um, so what we understand here is that um, the appropriate frequency um, may uh, vary depending on the knowledge uh, of the safety of the product. So we have different criteria to have in mind. So uh, the type of product. Um, so for example, we would expect a, f a higher frequency for uh, biologicals, uh, in including vaccines, antiparasitics, for example. Um, so the type of product it's 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 a it's an important parameter. Then also the time on the market. Um, we would expect a higher frequency for those um, products that have been on the market for less than ten years, and then a lower frequency if if it's an old product. We're talking about an old product that's been for many years on the market. And then the pharmacovigilance profile. So we would expect also a higher frequency of monitoring for products with a high number of adverse event reports and, and safety issues and a lower frequency for, for those products that, that their various, uh, have a pharmacovigilance profile, very stable. They have almost or, or no issues. Um, and, and then we would expect a lower um, frequency. Um, next slide. Um, so just to, to, to also explain what we mean by, by the frequency of monitoring. So here uh, we know that when, when cases are arriving, um, we expect that, that each case is, is looked into. Um, but we can think of uh, as this as when we're looking at one single case that arrived and it's being reported in the database, that's, it, it's, we're looking with a magnifying glass. We're just looking into the details. But when we're talking about the frequency um, of monitoring, when we expect you to, pe to perform signal detection in the, in the database, that's when we looked at all the community cases and that's where we're starting to look at new potential associations. Um, so that's what we mean by the frequency of monitoring. And as I was saying, so there are different criteria that we can have in mind uh, to, to, to determine how this frequency should be estimated. Um, but the message that we also want to give here is that um, the frequency should be uh, determined by the, by the MEHs. Um, we can give some guidance here. So what we would expect, for example, um, the minimal uh, requirement following the, the, the requirements in the legislation would be once a year. Um, so we know that at least once a year, uh, MEHs uh, should perform a signal analysis in the, in the Union Pharmacovigilance database. So we would expect that, for example, for products that have been uh, on the market for more than 10 years and there are no issues, um, so maybe that analysis once a year uh, would be sufficient. But then we go uh, using the criteria that, uh, that is mentioned there, then we go to other uh, cases. For example, if you have a new active substance, um, probably you want to have a, a higher frequency. So for example, once a month. Um, and then it's, uh, similarly, you can have other levels in between. So every six months or every three months or every th uh, six months. So we can just give uh, some general guidance here. And um, maybe um, as we gain more experience with the whole system, uh, we can give more detailed guidance on this. But for now, what we want to say is that, um, yeah, so, so we know that the minimal requirement is at least once a year. And we would, we would expect that for products uh, that have been long on the market, they have no issues, um, generally no issues, then maybe yes, once a year it's sufficient. But then um, using other criteria, you can then determine, um, should I do it once a month, every three months, or every uh, six months, or just up to, the, um, to each uh, company, thinking what should be more... Um, um, yeah, what should be the relevant approach here? Because it's also, in the end, it's also um, how you want to analyze this data. It's also ma many companies might prefer to have it, to do it once a month. And, and how also this in practical terms, how it's more useful to, to, to do it um, and easy and, and how it's more, yeah, the, the, the best approach here. Um, next slide, please. Go ahead, Daniel. Um, welcome back, everyone. Let's continue with the presentation for today. So um, I wanted to, to cover also signal validation. Um, what do we understand by signal validation? So um, as we described in, in the guideline 
this uh, this means for us uh, validation is the first step in analyzing a detected uh, signal to evaluate the initial data. And as a minimum, we would expect that um, ME agents uh, would check um, the following parameters. So, so if the event occur after the exposure to the medicinal product, and that is so if there is a temporal association, um, that the signal is not based on duplicates, and that the suspected adverse event is not already reflected in the SPC. And perhaps this last point is the most important. So um, some of the questions that might help you that um, during this uh, step, so um, during signal validation, what kind of questions you should ask yourself. So for example, does it fulfill the definition of a signal? Is this new information currently not reflected in the SPC? Um, does the event reflect a new aspect of a known risk? For example, a change in frequency, change of duration, time to onset, severity, occurrence pattern, outcome, or maybe an interaction with other VMPs. Has this association previously been addressed, maybe in other regulatory procedures or um, so what we're basically looking for here is that do we really, uh, does it really fulfill the definition of a signal that we have uh, previously discussed? So we have some tips here. So for example, when you're checking for previous awareness, um, we think it's important, um, especially for, for generic companies, to, um, to check with parent product because sometimes there are procedures going on or recent procedures where the innovator has um, has investigated, has assessed already an issue, and maybe it has been already um, addressed and has been added to the SPC. But sometimes we know from experience also in the human side that generic companies, sometimes they're not um, fully aware of all the procedures that uh, have been going on with the innovator product. So that's, pr for example, one of the things that we would say, well, it's important that you check also um, if there is, uh, if the issue that you're investigating has already been addressed in the by the innovator, um, also um, any previous assessments of the same issue in previous PSURs. So we know that we, uh, the pre PSURs will stop, uh, but in previous PSURs, a, a lot of safety issues have been investigated, and some of them. Um, so maybe they, 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 they will come in the future. And so for some products, there might be some safety issues that have been previously assessed and, and that can be also relevant for, for the investigation of, of your signal. So that can be also something that you might think of, of checking. Um, then for uh, checking if there are any changes, um, another tip could be useful to sort from high to low the number of clinical signs uh, reported and check whether this order has changed compared to the previous period um, or if a new clinical sign is reported more often. And then um, checking if um, the adverse event uh, is already reflected in the SPC. Um, sometimes this this can be a little bit tricky because it's not um, maybe it's not as easy uh, as just following if the exact term is already covered. But sometimes we have similar terms. Um, we have a we have a useful document that is called guidance note on the use of Petra terminology for reporting suspected adverse reactions in animals and humans. And, and, and we would suggest uh, you to, to refer to this document because um, it provides a lot of um, um, some guidance on, on this specific aspect. And, and for example, uh, we can think of the, the one typical example when we have um, the, the, the reports of allergy, anaphylactic shock, anaphylaxis. We know that sometimes these are uh, reported um, differently while um, it's not always very clear well if I have allergy and then we have anaphylaxis um, in the SPC is this really considered um, reflected or not so in this in this guidance uh, document we, we go into more details on, on this so um, Non-validated signals do not require any further assessment and should not be submitted or recorded in the Union Pharmacovigilance database. And uh, those that uh, those signals that are validated, uh, then further assessment assessment should be performed by the MAH. So then we would go to to the signal assessment and. Um, 
the assessment of a signal uh, should be as, co as comprehensive as possible. So then the main aim of, the, of performing this assessment uh, is to reach a high quality decision and signal outcome, uh, deciding if, uh, if the evidence supports a potential causal association, that is if, if the new risk or a change in new risk, which might have an impact on the, on the benefit risk of the product, and then decide on the potential uh, regulatory actions. So the main thing, so what is expected then from the MEH uh, for the signal assessment um, is a cumulative review. Um, next slide. And, and, and this is uh, what we mean by cumulative review. Um, we, we see it as an in-depth review of all the cumulative cases available to the MEH. So um, not just the new cases, but all cases in the database and, and as much data as, as, as you can gather, uh, all the available data that it's uh, avail available to, to, to you. Um, then during this assessment, then we would uh, expect to um, describe the number of supportive cases. So for example, if you have positive de-challenge or re-challenge, um, indicating those cases for which there is a lack of alternative explanations, uh, those cases with a potential uh, temporal association, um, and evaluate the potential association. And uh, this, in this case, not based with, uh, on ABON, because this, this will not be used anymore, but um, um, when you are evaluating the cases, just to evaluate if, if they are supportive of, of your signal. Um, also, if there are any indications from the veterinarian in the case reported, this adds to the stre uh, strength of evidence. Um, also describing um, if there is a possible biological me mechanism, a potential dose-reaction relationship, a plausible pharmacokinetic explanation, for, so for example, occurrence around the, the CMEX, the hepatic metabolism, renal clearance, and, and then also, um, as I was saying, so look into any other potential data sources. So you could look into the, the company database. Um, you could look in scientific literature if you find any evidence that could also add to the strength of this evaluation that could support your hypothesis, your, your signal assessment. Um, and then in the end, you should come up with a conclusion on the potential association of the adverse event and the veterinary medicinal product based on all this available evidence. And just to point out that, um, so what we expect here is that you come up with uh, the assessment of all the evidence that you have available. That doesn't mean that you will have all the time and um, all this information. So sometimes you you wouldn't you you will not have the uh, challenge re challenge information um, or or a potential biological mechanism. But as long as you have all this data available, you should review it all and go into an in depth uh, assessment of of all this uh, of all the evidence. And then after you have performed this assessment, so you should come up with uh, with a conclusion and decide on the on the outcomes, uh, pot uh, possible outcomes for the signal. So one possible outcome is that you say, well, the signal is refuted, uh, no need for further evaluation or action is necessary at this point in time, other other than routine pharmacovigilance, and I will explain this more into detail in the next slides. Another possible option is that um, there is a need for additional information and that means that a further follow-up of the signal is necessary uh, in the form of, of close monitoring. So you want, to, you want to keep following up more closely this issue because you, you expect that uh, potential new cases can, can give you a, a clear conclusion. Uh, but at the time, you cannot take that conclusion. I will also explain with more details in the next slide. And then for uh, another possible option is that you already think uh, there is a need for further regulatory action. And in this case, you can decide, uh, well, an amendment to the product information, to the SPC is necessary. So uh, maybe a warning or edit as an adverse reaction to the product information uh, or a contraindication. Um, another option uh, within the regulatory actions is to conduct a post-marketing surveillance study or um, maybe uh, additional risk minimization measures are necessary, such as educational materials or a dissemination of a direct animal healthcare professional communication. 
Um, another option is the suspension and withdrawal of the marketing authorization, a batch recall, or any other appropriate actions not listed uh, here. So about uh, refuting signal, uh, what, we, what do we mean by this and when should we go for this option? Um, we would go for this option when the potential causal association at present is unlikely. Uh, so when the available information suggests that the adverse events are more likely associated with other factors not related to the exposure of the, of the product. So for example, the underlying condition of the animal, other medicines, uh, etc. And one important uh, um, point to highlight is that the signal can still be reopened in the future if there is any new relevant information, uh, if, if it becomes available. So it doesn't mean that you refute the signal, you close the, you close the case, and then you never open it again. No, we always continue, continue monitoring it. And if there is new relevant in the future, you can, you can always reopen the, the signal and, and perform uh, another assessment with the updated uh, evidence. And refuted signals from uh, previous annual submissions uh, with no new relevant information available do not need to be resubmitted. Um, I will go into more details of, of what is uh, expected um, during this annual submission that is here um, uh, mentioned. Um, yes, so next slide, please. Um, close monitoring. Uh, what do we mean by this? Um, when uh, the available information is insufficient to conclude on a potential causal association, but further information is expected to provide evidence that could change this conclusion. So maybe you have um, one case, two cases, um, but but you know you're not totally clear, but you really want to follow this up because maybe it's a very new product or. Um, you know that a, a few more cases could really change your conclusion. So this this is another option. You can you can choose for close monitoring, and that means that 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 that, you, that the MHS will be expected to report at each yearly due date uh, the status uh, of this signal and and give an updated review of of the new cases. Um, it can also be uh, set by the authorities that shorty, shorter reporting periods uh, can be uh, decided. So um, it might be decided that you have to report on, on, uh, on the next six months um, on, on any new potential cases. And um, signals under closed monitoring um, for extended period of time. So for example, after two years, um, if you've been monitoring um, a signal and you see that, that there isn't any new information coming up of, on, on this issue, it can be proposed to stop the, the closed monitoring. Uh, and this can be done, done during the due date uh, with a detailed justification. Um, regarding the signal submission, so um, for signals where there is a new risk identified or a change to the benefit risk, um, the signal should be submitted in the Union Pharmacovigilance database and the, and the signals uh, will have a 30-day notification requirement. On the other hand, if, if the signal has been assessed and uh, throughout the year and there is no new risk or any changes to the benefit risk identified, then the signal should be submitted in the Union Pharmacovigilance database. Uh, but in this case, the signal can be submitted at any time throughout the year and, uh, and the, at the due date at the latest. So we expect, to sit, we expect you to submit all the signals that you have assessed. Um, even if, if there is no, no new risk identified or changes to the benefit risk, you have to submit it in the Union Pharmacovigilance database, but th there's, there's no urgent uh, requirement. So you can submit it throughout the year, um, but uh, please submit it before the due date. Um, so the due date at the latest. Um, so for this signal, so for signals where no new risk or changes to the benefit risk is identified, what is expected when we say that you have to submit the signals in the system? Um, the MEH. Uh, should submit the total number of cases and a brief summary uh, of the review of the cases and the conclusion of, on the assessment. So I have here one example 
Um, so, uh, for example, the signal of diarrhea and product X in dogs. And we would expect a few sentences just um, summarizing your review. So, for example, here, a total of say, six cases uh, reported, three cases with too limited information for assessment, two cases confounded by concomitant medication known to cause this event, um, one case considered related, uh, to the underlying condition of the dog. So therefore, the conclusion is the signal is refuted. So you will have this, um, you will have this space to, to, to put this, this sort of summary in the, in the Unit Pharmacovigilance database. And, and that's the, the, the minimum information that we would expect for, for this kind of signals. Yeah, I, th I have another example. Um, so, for so here, it's signal of blindness and uh, another product in cats. Um, a total of four cases reported, two cases with too limited information for assessment, one case confounded by underlying condition, an old age of the cat, and one case where the event occurred three months after the product was administered. Conclusion: Close monitoring. So this is just another example. So you have um, suspicion here that that maybe if you if you have uh, one case that, that you have one case that it's 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 uh, you're not totally sure, but maybe if you have another case reported, you want to follow this up. So your conclusion is uh, close monitoring. So that this would be also what we would expect uh, you to submit in the in the system. Then we go to signals for which uh, there is a 30-day notification. So um, for this, we have created uh, a notification form, a template. Um, so the form is to be used by MAHs for notification of signals requiring 30-day notification. So those are the signals that have been assessed and the conclusion is that the, there is a new risk or a potential impact on the benefit risk of the product. And therefore you will take uh, any further regulatory actions. So for those signals, we have a specific form. Um, this form will have to be included as an attachment with a signal entry in the signal module of the Union Pharmacovigilance database. And it's not to be used for non-validated signals, those we said that you should not submit, or signals with no proposals for further regulatory actions. Um, so the, the, just to go a little bit through the, through the form, uh, there will be an administrative part. Uh, we kept it very simple because um, in addition to the form, there, there will be also an entry in the, in the Uniform Acovigilance database. So um, just um, noting the, the date and, um, and the active substance and the product involved and all the other administrative information will be in the, in the Uniform Acovigilance database. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So well, it's a little bit small, but um, going a little bit, so what's included in this uh, template, uh, there is a, a first part um, with the highlights of the, uh, of the signal uh, divided in, in different subparts, so the clinical relevance. So here, for example, you can describe the seriousness criteria, um, <clears throat> the potential impact um, on, on public health. Um, so this, this will... We, we described all the, all the details of, of what you would be expected to, to include here, but um, this is just for guidance. So again, um, what you would have to include here is the data that you have available. It doesn't mean that you have to uh, include this data if, if it's not available. So it's just as, as guidance. So the green part will be a, a template as to be used as, okay, what kind of information um, that I have will have to be included here. Um, so yeah, so the clinical relevance, then the relevant statistical uh, measures. So for example, if you have a relevant ROR values, this is where you would provide it. Uh, incidence, then um, another section with any information on any previous awareness, if this issue has been assessed previously and any other regulatory procedure, um, or if that has been any other um, assessment at national, EU or non-EU level. Um, um, and then another section um, specifying any additional sources 
order than ultra vigilance. So that the, the main source that, that we cover is it's ultra vigilance. But of course, um, during the assessment, we want you to also go into any but any other potential data sources. So um, you should check if 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 there is any data coming from literature, clinical trials, uh, of the MEH database or any other additional database uh, where you could also add evidence to your to your assessment. Uh, next slide, please. And then there is a section on the background uh, of the signal. So um, the back here will be specifically the background of, of, the, of the product, of the active substance, the indication, uh, and the adverse reaction. So also on the epidemiology, on the case definition. Again, this is this is very the the, the guidance that is provided in the template is very complete. But uh, yes, you, you would be expected to provide as much information as possible as long as it's it's available. Um, next slide, please. And yes, yeah, so and then you have another part about signal validation and assessment. Um, so this is where you will have the main. Uh, a uh, summary review of all the evidence in ultra vigilance, so highlighting the total number of cases, uh, the cases that are supportive of the signal, uh, describing those cases with a positive uh, de-challenge, re-challenge, uh, the, the seriousness, the potential dose-reaction relationship, etc. So all the criteria that, uh, some of the criteria that we've mentioned here in the presentation, and then we also go into more detail in our guidance that is that has been published. Um, so that, this is the part where the main assessment will will come into in, in the template. And another part with the evidence from any other sources. Um, yeah, next slide, please. And then a final one, one before, yes. And, and then a final uh, part, which will include the conclusion and the proposals from, uh, for action by the marketing authorization holder. So once you have reviewed all the available evidence, you should come up with the final uh, conclusion on the potential causal association between the, the, the product and the, and the adverse event. And then uh, based on that conclusion, uh, the proposed regulatory action to address the signal. So if there is an, a, a need for an update of the SPC, if you want to add this as a new um, adverse reaction, if you want to include a new warning, a new contraindication, that would all come in, in this section. And next slide, please. And there's also a, a part mm, for Annex to include any literature references, any other attachment, um, again, only if applicable. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so we're done with the with the signal assessment, and and then I want to also explain about the due dates that we've mentioned a few times. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I think this this schema summarizes uh, very well what uh, what we've been discussing until until now, how we see the the uh, one year of surveillance uh, for for any given product by the MEH. Um, so. You have potential emerging safety issues. Uh, these are the, 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 the potential signals requiring very urgent attention because they have a potential major impact on the benefit risk balance. And just to, to remind you, so these are the, the ones with a three day notification and, and the ones that we consider the most, the most important and the, the ones that should be prioritized the, the first. Um, then any other we have any other validated signals um, um, we all, you should always uh, ask if, if 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 actually this is an emergency safety issue if not the question that you should ask when evaluating the signal is uh, is there a change to the benefit risk is there a new risk identified and then if the if the answer is yes then uh, again to remind you then there is a 30-day notification requirement if the answer is no, um, then we have a signal uh, that you have assessed throughout the year, but there is no uh, change to benefit risk or no new risk. And again, these are the signals that we want you to submit in the Uniform Market Vigilance database. You can submit them uh, throughout the year at any, at any time, but we want you at the latest to submit it uh, at the due date. So that's what we mean by the due date. So every part, every product uh, will be assigned a specific due date, and that will be uh, what we call the yearly submission. 
um, we try to 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 make this yearly submission as 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 simple as possible uh, for so, so for um, we know that there are many products that, for example, will not have uh, adverse events reported. And as we see here, so if you have a product for which no adverse events are reported throughout the year, the only thing that will be expected at the time of the yearly submission will be what we call here simple statement. I will show you in a few slides um, what this statement, um, what, what is specifically we mean by this. Um, also products for which there are adverse events reported, but then there have been no validated signals. The only thing that will be expected will be to comply with the, with the statement. And then if you have assessed, assessed signals uh, through the year, but there have been no changes to the benefit risk or no new risks identified, um, again, what would be expected is only to comply with the statement and to submit those signals um, in the Union Pharmacovigilance database throughout the year. <clears throat> um, next slide, please. So to explain a bit about, about the due dates um, and the background, um, we know there is a legal requirement in Article 81.2 from the regulation and Article 19.1 of the implementing regulation that establishes that MEHs have to submit at least once a year a sta uh, two statements. So one with a conclusion on the benefit risk balance and one statement confirming that the signal management process has been conducted. So in order to facilitate and coordinate the evaluation of the data during the first year of the implementation, uh, we decided to set some um, due dates um, and, and, and we have a list of due dates uh, proposed, and these are based on ATC VET code and system organ class. Um, we have a current list uh, that includes uh, the due dates that are spread throughout the year for all the products. And the, the idea is that after 2022, uh, based on all the gain experience, um, we will apply other group criteria. Uh, for now, we we will we have a, a draft list that um, our, our intention is to publish it um, very soon, um, and this will include all the due dates for for all the products. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is how it looks like how we have it already. It ha it, it has not been published yet, but it will be published soon. But again, so the, it's, it's the the list of the of the due dates for each specific product. Um, um, next slide, please. And then we go to the to the annual uh, uh, submission statements. So we said that that you're expected to comply with with uh, with the legislation and 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 complete two statements. Uh, one about the benefit risk balance, and we try to make this as simple as possible in the in the system in the Union Pharmacovigilance database, and. It will look something as it's here described in the slide. So it would be sort of a click box where you will decide either I confirm that the benefit risk balance remains unchanged, or sometimes it can be the, 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 the situation where there is a procedure ongoing concerning the benefit risk assessment. And then for the statement uh, about the adherence to VGVP guidelines, uh, there is another tick box. Um, that, that will say that I confirm that the signal management process has been conducted in compliance with the pharmacovigilance guidelines published by the agency and all assessed signals have been submitted. So again, we try to make this as simple as possible in the, in the system and it would look something, something like this. Um, next slide, please. So what else is expected from MEHs by the due date? Um, as I said, the signals that has been assessed throughout the year where no change to the benefit risk, no new risk or change to a known risk is identified. Um, again, these signals can be submitted at any time throughout the year, but by the due date at the latest. Then um, in the system, there will be also a specific part where other additional information can be submitted. And we have three specific cases for this. So uh, scientific literature findings on suspected adverse events from group of humans who cannot be identified individually, risks or relevant issues from off-label use cases with no suspected adverse events, 
um, or risks or relevant issues from special situation cases. So by this we mean misuse, medication error, and accidental exposure with no suspected adverse events. So this this is um, this will not be the case, but sometimes there are these kind of special situations and this kind of additional information that is reported, and that that it it, it's, it doesn't comply with um, with just to, to submit it in the in the as a signal. But but there will be a part where you can submit this um, this information in the system, and if this is the case, if you have this kind of information that you want to report in the system, we would expect you to report this uh, also at the time of the due date. Next slide, please. What else um, to be submitted by the due date? So, um, or to be um, to take into account? So, all MAHs shall conduct at least one signal detection analysis per year for each of their active substances or product in the Uniform Acovigilance database. So, this is what what we were talking about uh, the the legal requirement. So, uh, the legal requirement is that at least once a year. Uh, companies are expected to do this uh, signal det detection analysis. And what we have to have in mind is that um, this, this signal detection analysis on EVV should be performed within two months before the due date. So that's also something to have in mind um, by the due date. Um, Another point is that um, if you have signals under close monitoring by the due date, um, it's also expected that you provide a status or any updates uh, for those signals under, under close monitoring uh, if they have been submitted more than six months ago. Then another um, point to have in mind is that signals that have been under close monitoring for an extended period of time, let's say for example, for more than two years, uh, there is the option that you can propose to stop the monitoring, uh, the close monitoring, uh, and this can be proposed with a with a proper justification. And and in that in that case, the signal will change from close monitoring to a refuted signal. And in the case that you have been closely monitoring the issue, but actually for a long time, and no new cases have been reported, so by the time of a due date, this will be also possible. And then lastly, um, the incidents and, and sales data. This uh, st It's still to be developed and agreed because the legal deadline is actually uh, 2020 for 2024. But um, MEHs will also be expected in the future to submit um, the annual incidents and sales data. And we would expect that, that, that this will be submitted also by the, by the time of the due date. Um, next slide, please. And I think this is the, the last topic that I wanted to cover in the presentation. So the target signal management, um, and just in, in very few words, um, what we mean by, by target signal management. So uh, the Article 81.3 from the regulation, uh, it gives an option for NCAs and the agency to perform a targeted signal management process for any given veterinary medicinal product or group of veterinary medicinal products. So at any time, um, regulators can start a signal management procedure uh, at any time throughout the year. And if this is the case, uh, then MEHs uh, are expected uh, to collaborate with the, with the agency and the NCAs and provide any requested information in a timely manner. So this is another uh, procedure that uh, that it's also there that that will also happen in uh, um, with the new with the new legislation. And um, next slide, I think. Yeah. So that's that's everything <laughs> for now. So this is the end of the presentation. I think we have a lot of questions coming in uh, in the chat, but we also reserved uh, a lot of time for for Q and A session. I'm sure you have a lot of questions, so we will try to answer um, some of them. <laughs> yes, thank you very much, Daniel, and perfect timing. And I'm copying the last questions coming in on that one document. So the proposal is now, and, and I hope this presentation has helped you all to understand a little bit better the guidelines that have been published. And we can see from the questions, you, of course, you have a lot of questions which are often very practical, some relate to hopefully tomorrow to the training session and some will relate to 
the training session in January on how to practically um, send a, a signal, for example. But the way I propose that we proceed now is that I go, uh, I read out all the questions that have come in and that then Daniel, Laura or myself will try to answer the questions. Uh, but I also invite at the same time, I know a lot of our colleagues, regulators are um, online. So please, if you have anything to add or questions, because this, this Q&A session is not only about us answering, trying to answer all the questions. This is also about trying to also learn from the discussion, hopefully, and, and, and anything that we still have to improve and have to implement. So regulators, please uh, lift your hand if on one of the questions or the answers that we're giving you also would like to come in and, and add anything or have perhaps a different view. Or And then after the question, I will also invite the all participants to come up with any other question that perhaps relates to that that topic that we just have been touching on. So that's that's the sequence. I will go through all the questions that have been um, posted in the chat during the presentation. Okay, I'll start with the first question from Anna Seidel that was about uh, could we please describe the PSMF reference? I think that was on my slide where we show that this PSMF reference goes goes into the into the product database. I have to refer for that one to the uh, training that will come up on the eighth of December. So there we, we we can go into the into the detail. This is not directly related to signal detection and signal management. So then the first Question from Nuria. If you don't detect any signal for a specific product in a year, you should make an annual declaration to question mark. Daniel, please. Yes, indeed. So I think I explained this in one of the on one of the schemas. I don't, maybe it's useful to, to have it on the screen. I don't know if it's possible. But uh, indeed, so the minimum that we would expect, if you have a product and there are no adverse events reported throughout the year, or maybe the product is not even on the market, um, still to comply with the legal uh, legislation, um, the statements, it's not a report, it's just, as I showed, it, it will be made as simple as possible in the in the Union Pharmacovigilance database, but you will have to complete this uh, statement. So one about the benefit risk balance and one with the, um, confirming the adherence to the guidelines. So yeah, so if there are no signals or no reports, that will be in the minimum that it's that it's expected. And maybe I can I can add. So it, it really comes from the 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 regulation itself that requires in Article eighty one to submit something about the uh, benefit risk every year. So we can't escape that type of requirement. And the way we have implemented this to make it as simple as possible, as explained by Daniel. So if you don't have any data or if you don't have any signals after many years of a product on the market, for example, you, you indeed you still have to. Um, declare and take the tick boxes but we hopefully made it as simple as possible so it's just to make sure that we that you you can comply with that uh, requirement of article 81. i can't see the hands on my screen here if not for the moment no no worries we would i think we we just continue with the next question and you can lift your hand later on if you think your audio will be working at that moment and then we'll take that question so i'll move to the next question also from nuria the annual declarations could be grouped by active substances on different products um, uh, yes this is indeed the intention but i have to say that we're also waiting for us uh, to see the system but one of the specifications that the requirements that we have put forward to the developers is that, and that is a, a, a big topic that we have been discussing with the industry in the stakeholders meetings, that um, one way of, of limiting the work and with less administrative burden would be to allow you to group products uh, for the submission of the annual declarations. 
is, is one part, but also for the analysis of the signals. So my answer is yes, but hopefully we can show you in, in uh, more detail at the next, well, we should be in the position then the next um, training in January. And hopefully we, it, it can be done in an easy and straightforward way. Concerning the sources mentioned, that's a question from Anna Seidel. Uh, what about spontaneous reports from vets and animal owners? Uh, Daniel, I think, I'm not sure, I was surprised by the question. Of course, the spontaneous reports from vets and animal owners are, uh, are the predominant number uh, of reports that are coming in. Uh, so I, I don't know what the question really is. Uh, maybe it was not not that clear on that slide, do you remember? Um, I mean, it, just to confirm, absolutely, um, one of the main sources would be the spontaneous reports from vets and, and animal owners. And we'll, maybe we'll have to review that slide if it's not coming out clearly. Um, should all lack of efficacies be prioritized or only for anesthesia products is the next question. Uh, and that relates to the list MI terms. Um, who wants to take that? <laughs> it's a difficult one. Um, any from regulators listening in, lifting the hand and want to, that's a, it's an interesting question. My point of view would be that for definitely for other products, lack of efficacy, it's, it's also important that that can not be ignored as a potential signal. Um, whether you would prioritize it immediately, possibly, um, I mean, the, the focus would be, and that's why we have come up with the medically important terms lists. If it's listed there, that should be helping you for prioritizing, but it doesn't mean that lack of efficacy is excluded for for other products um, as as a potential signal. I think then we have clarified also one of the questions early on was about what what, what do we really mean with cumul cumulative cases? I think you had several slides on this. So it basically means um, the cases that have been reported over the life cycle of, of a product. Then the next question from Will Drury, uh, for the proposed thresholds for signal, and then in brackets, three cumulative cases for MI terms and five for non-MI terms, what is the recommendation for a subsequent review after the first signal detection? Once the threshold has been reached, will the same signal be triggered every time after the threshold has been exceeded? So it's a good question, Daniel. We, you, from your experience working on on the human side, how how would you answer this? Yeah, maybe. I mean, it's good to point out uh, again that the, the, what we mean by a signal shouldn't be viewed as something that because something has exceeded a, a determined threshold, therefore it's a signal, and that therefore um, every new case. Every time you get a new case, it's a signal. So the way the way I see it, so if you have a signal and what you call your threshold, um, we hope that you mean well. We hope that it's not only just a statistical parameter, but then um, you have enough data there to to go for to investigate the signal, and then you perform a proper assessment of the whole issue. And let's say that 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 the, your conclusion is is to refute it, uh, for example. So you close the signal because the available information at the moment. Um, shows that the potential association is unlikely and then you say okay i refute the signal but I, I, as i understand the question is okay but then if you get new cases should you review it all the time i think it it's it's uh, it's one of those times where you have to be flexible it depends on the signal it depends um on your conclusion on when you review the data because if if you look at all the cases and and your conclusion is that well the cases seem to be actually related to the underlying condition of the animal then uh, then probably if you have a few more cases um that wouldn't change their conclusion 
unless I would say unless you have a lot more cases, um, then I would do for, I would go for another updated review because you know that maybe with more cases. Uh, the, the conclusion can be different but again there's no strict rule here like once you have performed uh, and have assessed a signal we say well that doesn't prevent you from opening the signal in the future um, but we don't want you to see it as, as, as something that has exceeded the threshold therefore you have to um, one case more one case more you have to review review no that's that's not the main idea so I would say, um, yeah, we have to be flexible in this. You have to, it depends on what's the, 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 the assessment of the data, what it tells you. And, and, if you have, and then if you close a signal and then you see that you keep receiving a lot of cases, yes, then it would be justified that you, provi that you provide an updated review, that you review again the, 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 the cases and, and see if your conclusion, the, your conclusion has changed or not. So... Yeah, difficult to give a yeah definitive guidance on this, but yeah, that's the main idea. Thank you for this, Daniel. I think it's it's a good response, but I'm still inviting our regulatory common colleagues or any anybody else with a related question or other input. Yes. Else, I'm gonna unmute you now so you can ask. Your question. You are unmuted. Thank you, Irene. Uh, just to say, when you will use data warehouse, besides the number of cases, you will also see the in data warehouse. I'm only speaking of data warehouse because I don't know other systems for the moment. Then you will also see that the system uh, would give you um, if the PRR has exceeded a certain threshold and this can also be taken into into consideration when you are looking at data. Uh, we didn't go into this. I, I think that, um, suppose that Laura will explain this a little bit more in detail tomorrow. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Els. And for those who have not recognized her voice, this was Els de Waala, our head of the Pharmacovigilance Working Party and working for the Belgian Agency. So I'm coming to the next question. Um, in emerging safety issue reporting within three working days from time point when identified as ESI or from day zero of the initial underlying adverse event report, and that's from Vladislav Kurtev. And then there have been uh, similar questions raised on when do you define really an, an ESI? It was also related to the two examples of Cabergolin and the BVD vaccine. Um, so let me try to answer that question. Um, the way it is looked at is when you as a company identify something, so it can be one or can be more reports or other events as an emerging safety issue. And, and again, these are ones that we normally only have once or twice a year where really important safety restrictions have to be taken or even the product has to be taken from the market um, in view of animal and public health. So we're talking about those rare situations, luckily. So you should not be often in the case of, of thinking this is, that should be your, your judgment, I think, as a company. Is this issue potentially leading to uh, an important safety restriction or um, will it will it restrict my product going to the market further in the EU? So that's that at that moment when you have that consideration, when you have any communication in in house on the, on that, I think that's the moment when you would when you should consider um, as soon as possible within three working days to inform the relevant regulatory authorities. Uh, what the question was specific how was this done for the cabergolin and and the bvd vaccine i think those are two different cases i remember for the cabergolin that was really very early on done by the company who had identified um that cows which is not something that you would expect uh, when a product goes to to market that type of product 
So I mean, we don't, we didn't have the three-day requirement as such uh, in our guideline in, in place, but that's what I remember. Um, when when that was the trigger, I, I believe, but it was the company who who took the responsibilities very serious, and and uh, we were informed very early on. Okay, I'm going to the next question. What does cumulative mean? I think we've done that one. Then I'm going to... Uh, an, a related question on the ESI is Ivona Horsman on is it meant that suspension should be due to safety reasons and not due to the marketization decision for other, re other reasons, uh, e.g. financial... Uh, market related reasons so absolutely Ivona this is really um, suspension related to important changes of benefit risk let's say I think I'm moving now to question from Urian Mortimer can you clarify when a signal qualifies as an ESI, as there was an example in 30-day uh, single notification with actions in, in including a contraindication, isn't that primarily a signal to be assessed whether it qualifies as an ESI? I think it would be very rare for a contraindication, the ones that we typically know, know going into an SPC to be qualified as an emerging uh, safety issue. Of course it can be. If it if it contraindication affects uh, more than fifty percent of your market, then the, w there would be a need for a communication and so on. But if it is a very specific contraindication, like we typically know them going in the SPC, I, I would say this is not qualifying and as an emerging safety issue. Then a question from um, S. Günther. Which data set is regarded as very small? Can you give a number of adverse event reports, e.g. number of adverse event reports per year? And that was related to a, a slide on about the use of um, statistical tools and measures. Um, Daniel? or. Yeah, or, or yeah, or maybe my 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 view is that I think um, of course in our case EVVET has so many data that that's you cannot go through all the data. That's when you bring in your statistical measures and statistical tools. So in case when you have your local database and you are, for example, an SME, and you can handle your data set. Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis by reviewing all the data. As long as that's the case, then you don't need any of your statistical tools to help you with that type of exercise. So it, it's really related to the manpower that you have available and, and the availability to review the data that are coming in. Once, it, once you have um, a larger portfolio of products and reports coming in, that's when you would need, or when you can use uh, the help of these um, st the statistical tools. Again, flexible, we, we can't give you a, a proper number, I think would be, would be easier, but at, at, at the, um, on the other hand, it gives, it gives you also more flexibility. And I assume that many of the smaller companies, uh, and hopefully, the system is easy, handable, and Laura will show you tomorrow. You could um, use our own elements on EVVET to do that querying directly and using the tools available there. Next question from Will Drury. To clarify the statement that there is no requirement to routinely analyze historical data, does that mean that you're doing the signal detection only on new data received since the data of the last signal detection? Do you want to take that one, Daniel? I think that's a little bit of both. 
Yeah, I, I think yes to confirm. Yeah, indeed. So that's that's the main message. So in principle, we don't expect companies to go and start looking for signals in historical data when you don't have new cases reported. So we would expect to 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 start looking at uh, the new cases coming in, and 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 based on that perform signal detection signal management but again when when we uh, expect an assessment of a signal we don't expect just the cases for a certain period we want the cumulative cases so if you're looking into a potential uh, signal a potential association between your product and an adverse event and then you have x cases uh, available in the database from like cumulative so throughout the whole life cycle of the product then we want to we want to have an assessment of all the cases because there's no reason to exclude cases that can provide a further evidence um, supporting uh, that potential association. So that's why we say all the time cumulative cases because, yeah, we 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 want all the cases and and assess as much evidence as there is available um, in order to come to a high quality decision and the proper uh, course of action. But yeah, so with the same, if, if there is a product that has been on the market for so many years and, and there is no new cases coming in and well, there's it, it's not the idea that you have to go back to the data from 10 years ago and start looking for signals from very old cases. Thank you, Daniel. And I think it's also relevant here that um, if for an older product, for example, you have already analyze certain signals as part of your routine PSUR assessments, which you have done for many years on the older products. Of course, this is an argument for you, even if the system brings up a signal for you then to say, well, this is a signal that I have already assessed and was part of the analysis in uh, in a PSUR three years ago, for example. So that's all another reason to say um, that it's not really new data, that you have already looked at it. Then question from Camille Gaillet. Um, to evaluate the time on the market, could we consider the first EA state where the product was marketed when a product is not registered via centralized procedure? Yes, indeed, I think that's that's correct. It will be the first uh, time a, a product is being marketed, but then as explained by Daniel in the presentation on, on the other slides, it's also about um, stability of your of your profile. So it could be that um, for certain products, it, it just takes longer. Uh, you have still have important uh, signals discovered or new data coming in. So it's not so simple to, again, again, flexibility is not so simple to say, this is the 10 years, or this is where you have come to, um, you know, in, in a stable Fumbovich's profile. Having said that, I think we, what we, I think most of you know that from a regulatory point of view, we're trying to set up um, a group of experts within the EU that will also reviewing the adverse event data as they come into Eurovigilance. They, at the same time, they will apply a similar risk-based approach and um, which in, which will include, for example, the time on the market. A question from Dr. Birgit Roser, or Rosé. In case the VEDRA terms are updated and the term for my signal is no longer available, what have I to do? Um, Laura, maybe are I, I think it's very rare when uh, a veteran term is really deprecated. It happens, but then it's mostly linked to a new term. I want to come in and confirm, maybe. Uh, yes, that's correct. In and in most cases, then the data will be in, for example, in the system in the data warehouse will be related to the new VEDRA term, so you will still be able to uh, find the cases. 
how much. A question from Carles. If a product has been in the market for more than 10 years, but a considerable amount of adverse event are received, can we still submit the signal detection report on a yearly basis? Exactly. So it's not really the signal yearly detection report. It's whenever you see um, a, a new signal coming up, you are expected to submit that signal, even if you have refuted it. So that's the, and that can be any time after marketing, can be 10 years or longer. Whenever there's a new signal, the requirement would be next to the yearly uh, submission of the, the statements to provide uh, that information into the database. A question from Marty Nevelain. Death is an inherent risk of anesthesia, however, it's not usually listed as an adverse reaction in the SPC of anesthetics. And then um, he refers to the VGVP, reads, signals involving MI vetter terms should always be prioritized even in the absence of any statistical disproportionality measure, unless they are already considered adequately reflected in the current product information. What would be the recommended approach in single detection for anesthetics, taking into account that such a background noise of anesthetics deaths is always present? Um, good question. My, my, my answer would be on that, but I invite also, again, regulators. I mean, many products are probably in that situation where you treat them in, on uh, quite sick animals, so there's always a risk of, of, um, of that occurring, and it's part of the disease that you're actually treating. So it's not, it's not only related to anesthetics. What is important, that's also why it's in the guideline on, uh, uh, on collecting the information, is that we allow and we, we ask that whenever you have specific information from the, from the treating veterinarian that he suspects a particular product being the suspect of deaths, and let's say this, there's a case now that is coming in on um, a veterinarian who says, actually, I am seeing higher death rates with this particular anesthetic that I'm used to seeing. That specific information should be in the report, in the narrative. And that's also mentioned in that guideline. So that's for me a, a trigger in that case for you to still consider, yes, that is normally not um, a term that is really as associated in the SPCs for anesthetics, but if you have reports specifically coming in where the veterinarians say, my issue is here, that is not any other adverse event related to the anesthetic, but it is the death itself, then of course it becomes a matter of a signal and it needs to be investigated further. So I would relate it very much to the, the actual report coming in and the supporting data in that report. <clears throat> And thank you, Anita. I think you you absolutely link it to other uh, veteran terms that are available to give more detail about um, the events occurring during or up to death. Question from Ala Vishkotsan. I hope I pronounce it okay. -ish. Where due dates for annual reporting can be found? So we, um, the due dates have been discussed. The latest proposal was, I think, presented at the stakeholder meeting a few weeks ago to the industry. And this was agreed in principle last week by the Farm Vigis Working Party. And um, we're going to publish them soon. So I can't commit in the next days because we have to sign them off internally and present them, but they will be published soon.
Next question from Al Castellbrink. What is the timetable for the performance of signal validation and later than signal assessment? So I, I think, is there a time set timetable for your validation and your assessment, Daniel? There isn't. So what's what's your practice from uh, experience on the human side as well? So the, it, it's all it's one process, right? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can see it as one one process. And then, like I was saying, so validation would be like the initial first check of your data. And then, of course, when you go to perform single assessment, it's, 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 you need to perform an in-depth evaluation of all the available data. So that will take more time. Um, regarding the timeline, pff, <laughs> it's it's really up to whoever is performing the assessment and... Of course, I mean, if we're depending on what kind of issue we're talking, the idea would be also that uh, if it's a serious issue with um, with more relevance, high relevance, that you would give a, a higher priority to, to to those kind of signals, and they would do in in due time. But it's difficult to give a fixed timeline. There's no fixed timeline for this. It's as as the whoever is doing the assessment, how 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 you structure it, and yeah. Thank you. Again, flexibility allowed. Question from Barbara Falero. Conclusions of signal analysis should be assessed by a veterinary professional? Question mark. I think there is the recommendation in the implementing regulation that you should have, and the guidelines that you should have, you should have access uh, to a veterinarian. Uh, in ca whenever necessary. I think that's the recommendation. Question from Alejandro Azierta. If the name of the VMP does not appear and only the active substance is mentioned, it must be communicated in the same way by the marketing authorization holders. Laura. That is a question for you. So if the name of the VMP does not appear and only the active substance is mentioned, it must be communicated in the same way by the MEHs. At the moment, um, when the system goes live, the access to the data for marketing authorization holders will be on product base level. So MEHs will have access to data for their products. So when in a report only the active substance is mentioned, we don't necessarily know for which marketing authorization holder that product, uh, that substance may belong because more than one product may contain that active substance. So in principle, you will not have to perform, uh, to add that case to the rest of the cases for your products. Does that answer the question, Jos? Yeah, I, th I think there are several interpretations maybe uh, of the question. I, if, it is about the, if the question is about reporting an individual case, uh, and I think that was covered in the last training session, yes, you can, you should submit the, uh, if you don't have the perfect product name, you have the ability in the EU to submit cases on active substance information only. So that's the other part of the answer, maybe. If it relates to reporting, you have to submit it. If it relates to analysis, it's at product, date, at product uh, uh, name level. We are still discussing the levels of access within the projects because it, within the, both the UPD and the EVVET project. So if it is considered necessary to give wider access, we may reopen the access policy to allow access to marketing authorization holders to those cases as well. Very good. Katrina, no, no hands for the moment yet raised. No? Okay. I'll continue. Question from Kristen Mandelo. If the SPC already has listed hepatopathy, but more specific hepatic-related signs or signaling, 
Under what conditions would something be considered new information not already covered by the SPC? Daniel. Um, yeah, this is a very good question and it brings always a lot of discussion. So I think when when you go into more specific, in you have some terms that you might consider covered or not covered, you need to think also about... Um, risk minimization activities like would this information in the product information change the 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 the, the, um, the, the, the action from the from the healthcare professional would this provide a, a added value in terms of risk minim minimization measures i think that would be the correct way to think about it but it's so yeah if you go into more serious more specific terms for example then you should be thinking well does that having that specific more uh, having that term which is most specific does it help me with the course of action of what the veterinarian should do uh, because maybe the, the you can consider it covered by a more general term but maybe specifying more specific terms then you, maybe the veterinarian knows what kind of di uh, what kind of test they should run, or they have a better uh, prognosis information, or so. Yes, I mean it. It, it really depends on a case by case um, basis, and that this is some something that has to be discussed. And the guidance can be given is think think of in terms of risk minimization um, measures. Is uh, would this um, more specific term, even though it can be considered somewhat covered by a more general term is this adding value to the to the product information um i think that's how we see it in in human for example yeah thank you very much daniel then the next question from magali Keta. And that was about the notification form that you have presented, uh, Daniel. And there was actually a link provided by Antoinette Tolkamp. That link is the, the human uh, relevant document that you've used as the example. So the question is, when are we going to publish our veterinary um, document for the assessment of uh, 30 days submission? Did the template, the template document oh, yeah. so we haven't published it yet and uh, that's next on our agenda mm -hmm. um, the issue there again is that we have to pass it through some of our expert groups to finalize it and to sign it off so it's not for the coming days but we'll hopefully do it very soon and a question from Rul van Lissot. Will we have to check these boxes for the annual statement for every authorization or is there a possibility to do this all for all same similar products at once? That is the requirement, uh, Rul, that we have, we hopefully see a system coming where you could do it uh, jointly for your same and similar products but we're a bit in the same situation as you. We still have waiting to see the first version and to see how how easy in practice it can be done in, in the at first release. So hopefully we can demonstrate it to you in an easy way in January. Question from Alexandra Hirsch. Uh, what is the single detection approach for adverse events from clinical studies? Are they separated or are they pulled from spontaneous adverse events from single detection? Adverse events from studies can be entered as one case per study with number of animals per vedra code or alternatively as one case per vedra code. This may affect e.g. ROR. Is there a preference how to enter this into EVVET? I think it is partly being covered last time at the uh, training on adverse event reporting and maybe Glickeri, I'm not sure if you could help me out on this one. Um, I think the big change compared to the current situation is that we allowing reporting of uh, clinical studies. Previously, we said it, it, it should happen actually expeditedly during the study. Now it can be with the final study, study report, but that's not really your question. Your question is, um, is it one case per study? So, yeah, it's, um, 
I don't really have the immediate answer. Colleagues, regulators, else maybe. Can you, <clears throat> what would be the, your preferred approach or Daniel, I don't know. I think it's also related to the, you know, the type of event that is happening. Yes. Else, go ahead. Thank you, Else. Uh, I don't know if I can help you out here. If you would look at how it's done today, they can send it forward uh, individually. Don't think we touched if we want to have them grouped or not. I don't know if that's if that's the question here. Um, of course, if we put in our guidance that um, they can wait until the study is ended, perhaps there should also be flexibility, but we didn't discuss it uh, as I am aware of. No, I, and, and I don't know, but in the new in the new system, which then is VICH compliant, it will be possible to include the number of animals for each federal term. So, if even if you can if you include them as one case per study, that allows you then to, for example, attach the exact study uh, final report. For example, you can then indicate the number of animals. So you could cover probably most of the valuable information in a single report, which then not really would affect the ROR because the ROR then can be based on the number of animals. But at, but again, that is still a lot under development, I would say, and to be discussed. But uh, thank you for the question. And that's, that's one of the examples where we can, we, we can learn from today and, and where there is more Guidance needed. Oh, Laura, you want to come in? No, I was thinking, I was just looking at the queries we have, which I'm going to. Can you hear me? Or... Yeah. I was looking at the report that I'm going to demo tomorrow, and the system allows you to look at both the number of cases and number of animals reacted as well. So you can always um, look at both aspects of the data. In most of the reports, the error is calculated at the based on the number of cases, but we have a specific one that uses the number of animals reacted for the calculation of the ROR. So that is covered as well. Thank you, Laura. And then so it means also we can come back to it tomorrow and see how the system can help out on with these type of situations. Another question from Alexandra Hirsch. Uh, the new SPC seems to require listing of LLT. How does this fit to single detection at PT level? Daniel, is another question for you. <laughs> but but I think the, the arguments of doing actually the analysis at PT level, that's yeah, I mean, uh, we, we know, at least we know from the human side that best practice is to perform signal detection at PT level. That's the one that gives the better results, is the most efficient. The, it's it's based on also research that has been published that is the best level to, to perform this uh, analysis. I don't know if the, the this is going to change um, the LLTs because, I mean, usually LLTs are also synonyms. They should, well, I, I don't know if this is the case, but... Um, at least in human, my, my background is in uh, human pharmacovigilance. And, and, and there we also list the PT levels and we perform signal management at PT level. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> I bet actually this, this is something we were discussing recently as well. Um, we can only just, I mean, for now we can say that the, Doing it at PT level is 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 considered best practice. It's, it's what it has been shown to 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 provide the best best results. Uh, question from Sarah Bodeby. 
so if you have made a single detection earlier than two months before due date, you would have to do a new one within two months from due date, question mark. So again, I'm going to ask my regulators to come in um, that are online because my, my personal view on this is that so it's it's in the question already. If you have made a single detection earlier than two months before a due date, so the one of the key messages today was continuous single detection. That means you react on the data coming in. So you're not driven by the time really, and the time is here two months, but you're really driven by the data coming in. So let's say at three months you have certain data coming in that that suspect that you that there's a signal in there. And you do your analysis, then you actually do exactly what you're asked to do: is so continue single detection. And then your question is: Should I actually one month later then redo that type of analysis? From my point of view, um, but that applies then to the companies that are doing that analysis directly in EVVET. No, you don't have to do that analysis again. However, this um, this requirement for two months came in for those companies that are doing the analysis in their own database and only do that one yearly analysis once in EV. For those companies, they should organize that, that uh, single analysis for which we also pro will provide a bit more guidance on what would be expected for that single, single uh, analysis. That should happen within two months. So it's it's from my from my point of view, uh, the two months requirement is really restricted to those companies that are um, using their own database and actually are doing only once per year for a product the analysis in EV. So, but I, I I I stress this is again something that hasn't been discussed fully or agreed on, and I invite other regulators also to come in for their view, or maybe confirm. Else, is that is that what what your view, or do you have a more moderate view on this, or Anita, or anybody else? Oh, thank you, else. I mean, the, I remember when we discussed it, it's it's also the other way around. Uh, if you have your due date today and you have submitted your analysis, but tomorrow you have your data coming in on a new signal, at the same time, you're then required to do continuous signal uh, detection and, uh, and perhaps uh, send a 30-day submission a little later. So the key message is continuous signal uh, assessment. <clears throat> that is the the last one on my uh, sheet here, but I'm going. There have been more questions coming in. I think since we have started. If the MEH misses the due date for their yearly submission of the single detection analysis, will be, will this be indicated tagged in the database? Um. We are only organizing ourselves, and 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 we as it is foreseen that the database should allow us to query and to come up with uh, at one stage to to show us those uh, companies that have submitted the information. So so that would allow us to organize our own workload, and with that um, expert group that we are about to set up. So yes, it would it should be possible for us to identify. Uh, which are the companies and for which products if we're talking about products uh, have we have received already the, the yearly submission or for which we have not received it. Um, having said that, it, it is the objective still again to apply a risk-based approach. So this it, it is going to be impossible for assessing all the information and probably also not necessary. It's not that it's not impossible, but it's not necessary to assess all the information for all the products on a yearly basis. There will be a risk-based approach from the start. So certain products uh, following a risk-based approach will 
only be targeted on a, on a yearly basis for review um, by this by this this specific expert group. Then a question uh, from Deep. We practically how from Ronnie, how will the MIT list be maintained? Will industry be involved similar to VEDRA committee? If MIT are added, would be would it be expected to do a retrospective analysis? I mean it's a it's a good question. Um on the other hand, VEDRA is in itself a VICH level um term list while the MI medically important terms list is not yet. So um, it is a, it's, it's a European approach, not yet at the level uh, of VICH. And it's only at VICH that industry is fully involved in reviewing um, the new VEDRA terms. So it's not that the MI term is, is in, uh, involving uh, the industry directly in its development. Having said that, it is definitely our intention to continue um, working on a really collaborative approach. And whenever we or this expert group has identified new um, candidates for this list, I'm sure we're going to look for an opportunity to check this out with, with, with the stakeholders. Question from Magali Ketin. What will happen if the EMA exper expert group com come to a different conclusion than the MEH? Um, a, a conclusion on the recommended action. The, there are legal mechanisms in place in this legislation to enforce um, the regulatory view. It's the short answer. So it's not like it's in the US where you have a constant exchange of views and where you have a, a compromise agreement. I mean, that's always always the, the case in the EU. I think we always try to come up with the statements on the SPC. Um, but if it comes to the point that there is a different difference of view, there are legal mechanisms to impose the regulatory view. Question from Yuka Peson and Orion. If the MEH, not necessarily the originator, identifies a signal requiring 30, uh, 30 days notification for a generic product, does that trigger an EU assessment and EMA coordinated data request for all MEHs within with the same active ingredient? That's a good question for which we also do not have a direct answer uh, yet. Um, because we've learned also from the feedback that was received from the pilot exercise that took place on the human side. You know, on the human side, the actual signal detection is being uh, more, most of it is, is done from the regulator's point of view on top of the, of course, the individual responsibilities of the companies to do it. But it's not so that the companies um, were submitting their analysis continuously because they're continuing with the PSUR, um, PSUR uh, system, based system. But their legislation actually still requires companies to do that. So there was a pilot exercise taking place, and one of the outcomes of the pilot exercise was exactly this, where uh, it was seen that there was quite a number of duplication happening on signals identified by um, generics on topics that had already been addressed by the generic uh, companies. But it can it can work the other way around. Um, I, I, my personal view is here is that if, if and we, we have actually a case for the moment, if there is a generic that for which um, a signal has been identified, the first issue will be to try to investigate and, and to dig into the available data that we have for that, gener that generic and to see if there 
really is a causal association, if that causal association has been established, or if, for example, uh, an analysis can be done at a higher level, at active substance level, if, if that adds more power to the analysis, and if that then would, would affect the other uh, products, generics, or the originator on the market, then they would be involved in the in the in the whole procedure and in the analysis. But you can hear from my answer that we haven't established a, a, a proper procedure or uh, for that type of exercise. Again, flexibility at this stage. Question from A. Honnens. A question regarding frequency of monitoring. It was stated that the high frequency should be applied in products with high number of adverse events. Question. What means high number of adverse event reports? Please give an example. 10, 100, 500,000 per year. Um, Daniel, for the, for the easy questions. <laughs> um, yeah, again, it's it's it's. There's no fixed number that we can give. I know. I, I think if you think about certain products that you know that 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 antiparasitics, for example, that we know that they're known to have more issues, more adverse events reported. Um, then, for us, it makes sense that the frequency of monitoring would be higher than if you have a product for which barely any issues come up once every X years, or they has a very stable pharmacovigilance profile. So um, difficult to give a number, but yeah, depending on the type of product, we know that some products are known to have a high number of issues, more number of signals, and yeah, and for those, we think that it makes sense that, that, that the frequency of monitoring would be higher because you also don't want to deal with, with an accumulation of data um, so it's also from part from the company side, you want to to be able to deal with the data. You don't want to accumulate so many issues that suddenly you detect twenty signals and then you know you have to deal and you have to assess all of them. It's so the more the more issues, the more reports that you have, the better for you as well that you organize it better and you have a pro, a, an appropriate frequency of performing this analysis. So. But it, we don't have a fixed number. It's 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 yeah. You have to decide it depending on what the type of product you have and what you see on the data that is coming. Thank you very much, Daniel. Um, I think we have almost reached at the end, but I'm going to take one question more. That doesn't mean that we're not going to look at the remaining questions. We'll we'll see how we can answer them. Um, so one more here. The next one for me is from Tony Simon. How will SPC packaging changes be managed, especially for new products where a number of different signals may occur over a short number of months? MEH is maybe changing the SPC before previous change has have been in, uh, implemented. Will a pragmatic approach be possible here? Thanks. Um, Again, this is not has been not really the part of the subject of today. Um, this is about implementing like the SPC changes. I think it's a very relevant question that we will take uh, internally first to discuss also because in indeed we're trying to find um, the way forward also on how to process in a harmonized way in the EU the, the relevant variations that are uh, the, that are the outcome of, of, of all the signal management, uh, potentially the outcome of the signal management process. So I don't have a definite answer, but thank you for the question. And and uh, else, you're raising that your hand, else. Thank you for coming in. Yes, thank you, Jules. Uh, just also to come to the question of Tony. Bill possibly what you have to look at is also the urgency or the severity of, of the information you want to add in this respect. Um, so flexibility could be possible if it's only regular statements, I think, uh, if it would be my point of view. Um, but if there are urgent messages, uh, then perhaps we can't wait uh, and have to implement more directly. But as Joss already highlighted, 
this should be discussed more in detail. Thank you. Thank you very much, Else. Thank you. Okay, and by this, I think we're going to end today's session. And I thank you very much, Daniel, for the main presentation and everyone for the questions uh, that have been raised. We will try to publish. I think it will happen, the, the actual... Either okay. today or tomorrow, both presentations will be available in the page again. Okay, thank you very much, Katrina. And you've brought up the program for tomorrow. So tomorrow we'll starting at 10 o'clock again. And hopefully we see, we see you there for a similar good event like today. And then I wish you a good lunch. Thank you very much. And see you tomorrow.